As we are studying Leviticus, I invite you to open to Leviticus chapter 3. Uh, I had some of the men passing out a handout this morning that's helping us kind of bring together the offerings of Leviticus. And we have a few of those left over. If you didn't get one of those handouts and you'd like to have one of those charts, if you'll lift your hand up, uh, we've got some extras. We'd like to pass those out so you can follow along, try to fill in some of the blanks uh, in the sermon this morning. In our studying in Leviticus, what we're coming to understand is that uh, certainly God is a holy God. And as a holy God, he calls us to be a holy people. He calls us to live in that uh, a relationship with him as people who are holy. <clears throat> Today I want to begin with the context of our own lives. So before we jump into Leviticus chapter 3, I want us to think about where we're at today in our relationship with God. Uh, where are we today in our relationship with God? Uh, how many here know that they have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and so they've entered into that covenant relationship called the New Covenant. They, they're in this relationship with Jesus Christ that all their sins have been forgiven and that they have the assurance uh, that when they see God, they will not face God's wrath, but instead of facing God's wrath, they will receive the blessing of being in His presence for all eternity. And you've got that assurance, you've got that settled, you know that you entered that covenant, not based on your own good deeds, but you've entered that covenant based on the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, how many can tell me this morning, Pastor, that's the covenant I'm in, that's the relationship I have with Jesus Christ. Amen? Wonderful. Praise the Lord. And, and I hope that everybody would come to that uh, understanding that that covenant, that relationship with God is available. Uh, you can have all of your sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can have the assurance of knowing that when you see him, you won't face his wrath like we read about in the Psalms. But you'll, you'll receive the blessing of his presence for all eternity. But the question before the house is not, are you in that relationship? The question is, how do we live within that relationship? How do we live within that relationship? You've been saved and you're baptized, so now what? What do we do now? Um, you're in a covenant uh, with God based on the work of Christ. You're saved. You're declared righteous. You're justified. Well, how are we to live in that covenant? The Holy Spirit of God is helping us with that, with that challenge. The Holy Spirit is doing His transforming work in our life. There's a word for that. Uh, we call it sanctification. Sanctification is just the work the Holy Spirit is doing to make us more like Jesus Christ. The work that God is doing to make us more holy in our, in our lives today. He is, he is at work doing that. Now, friend, that is a very, very good thing. You and I both know that in the world in which we live, sin is rampant. We know that the heart that we still possess, the old sin nature, the flesh, though it's a defeated enemy, it is still uh, raging within our own lives. And we need and desire the Holy Spirit's work of purifying and cleansing and, and making us more holy uh, continually. We long for that. And God calls us, uh, God calls us to not only uh, recognize the Holy Spirit's work in that, but God calls us to participate in that. I'm thinking of like Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, which says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see God. And that word follow sounds kind of passive, but actually it's a very strong verb. It's a very active verb. It's, it's something that we are to participate in. It means to pursue or to strive, like somebody who's striving for a victory. It's the same word that Paul used when he said, I'm pressing on, right? I'm going after it. I make every effort for this. Uh, what, are, what are we making every effort for? Uh, peace with all men and holiness. So the Holy Spirit of God is working to make us holy in our lives today, but we also are to participate, and we also are to put forth and expend effort and press on, just like the Apostle Paul. So this morning, we're going to learn that the people of God who are in a relationship with God called salvation should continue to offer offerings for the purpose of communion and cleansing. So I've invited you to Leviticus. You're in chapter 3, but just fast forward just a couple chapters to Leviticus chapter 7. 
the very end of Leviticus chapter 7. We'll go back to chapter 3 in just a moment. But Leviticus chapter 7, at the very end. So this is a transition point in Leviticus. The first seven chapters cover the offerings that we've been talking about. And we're going to talk about this morning. And I want to see the conclusion. That God gives the offerings we've been studying to the Hebrew people as a way for them to live with him. God wants his people to commune with him. God recognizes that his people are going to struggle with sin. And so he has provided a means by which God's people in the Old Testament could live with him. Again, that's our central question this morning. How can we live in our relationship with God? And it says in verse 37 at the very end, this is the law of the burnt offering, of the meat offering, of the sin offering, the trespass offering, and of the consecrations, and of the sacrifices of the peace offering, which the Lord commanded Moses in Mount Sinai in a day that he commanded the children of Israel to offer their oblations unto the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, now friends, so as, as we just set our offerings messages in this context, we need to understand this. God is holy. He just entered their camp. He is dwelling in the Holy of Holies at the end of Exodus. And Leviticus opens with God speaking to Moses and saying, here are five, five offerings that you are to perform. Now, God's not doing that just because he's a mean ogre and he just wants to oppress them with laws and, 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 and ritual worship practices. God is commanding them to do these offerings because he wants a relationship with his people. He wants them to have free access to him. He longs for the worship of his people. And so he is making through these offerings a means available for people to live and dwell and commune and relate and fellowship with him. So this morning, as the people of God in the New Testament age, uh, we are going to learn that God continues to make a way for us to commune with him, to live with him in light of the fact that we ourselves today are not yet perfectly holy. So let's pray as we begin this. Lord, we ask that you would open the word of God to us as we've sung. It is our hearts to desire. Lord, we understand there are many things that separate us from you that we're not white. We're not holy as you are holy, though you've called us to that and you're working that. And Lord, we pray that in our lives today that we would uh, draw close to you. And through this message today that you would make it clear uh, how you accomplished that with the Hebrew people through the offerings that were offered and how you're doing that today through the perfect offering, Jesus Christ, in our own lives. We're so thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, you have a handout, and uh, we've covered so far uh, the first, which is the burnt offering in Leviticus chapter 1, and the second, the meal offering, last week in Leviticus chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at uh, now the third offering, the peace offering, in Leviticus chapter 3. All right, Leviticus chapter 3, and it says, If his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it uh, of the herd, whether it be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish to the Lord. Uh, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's uh, sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them which is by the flanks and, and the coal above the liver and the, the kidneys, it shall be, it, it shall he take away. And Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So what we just read there in the beginning of chapter three uh, is uh, what to do if somebody wants to bring a peace offering and they bring something from the herd, a, a cow or a cattle. Um, and verse 6 begins to tell us uh, what to do if somebody brings uh, something from the flock. And, um, and then verse 12 uh, tells us in that section about what to do if somebody brings a goat. And you'll find that all of the procedures are the same. 
you can bring any of those offerings as a peace offering to the Lord. So um, if, you're, if you're wanting to, to follow along, this offering is pointing us to the very first way we can continue in a relationship with God, and that is by communing with Him in delighting in all of His blessings. Delighting in all of His blessings. The, the, the blank there that you want to put in the key word for Leviticus chapter 3, I think, is the word delight. Go ahead and write that in that box there in the middle of your page. Delight. Delighting in the Lord. Communing with God means delighting in all the blessings of the covenant with Him. Now, I have here a, uh, in my bag a, a symbol to help us remember this. Okay? Uh, this is the, uh, the happy birthday hat. All right? The happy birthday hat. And uh, from time to time, not necessarily is it every birthday um, in our home, but from time to time, I'll, I'll find this in the, in, the, in the box, the birthday box, and we'll uh, pass it out to the person whose birthday it is. And we'll have them wear it, right, during the birthday. It's awesome. It's awesome when we get to break out the birthday hat and have somebody wear the birthday hat, right? Because here's what that means. That day, we're going to delight in the person wearing the hat right? It's, it's so, so much fun. The person who has the birthday, we get to make a special meal for them. We get to um, invite their friends over, uh, and, and people will offer that person gifts, and, uh, and we'll, um, before, we, before we have dinner, um, it's, it's my joy as dad or husband that day to stand up and kind of offer some words of praise, concerning uh, my daughters or my son or my wife and my wife doesn't necessarily like wearing the hat but uh, right but but uh, uh, we'll offer that word of exhortation and the joy we'll, we'll probably speak a little bit about the relationship the connection we have some of the benefits or the joy that comes into our life because of the connection we have with that person you get the idea on on a birthday how you delight in that person. All right, so this hat is going to help us understand that Leviticus chapter 3, when we talk about the peace offering, it is an opportunity that God gives his people to delight in all the things he does for them. All of his benefits, all of his blessing, all of that of who he is, the covenant that he has given them, all that that entails that the, when somebody brings a peace offering, they are, just like on a birthday, offering that gift or offering that verbal praise or, or highlighting the connection and the relationship that we have with that person. So when you think of the peace offering, I want you to think of delight, particularly a delight in God. Isn't it true that once you've been saved as a Christian, we should delight in all the promised blessings that we have in Jesus Christ? That we should. We should delight in all that we have in Jesus Christ. The, 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 the three stages in Leviticus teach us about living in the covenant. So the three first offerings, I should say that, the three first offerings, the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering, are really offerings that focus on how we have fellowship with God, how, how we have this blessing from God. And so the third offering is the peace offering. Whenever the Israelites wished to celebrate their relationship with God, they would bring a peace offering. And it would, it would indicate the relationship between the, the one being worshipped and the worshiper. It was the most joyous celebration, just like a birthday would be. It's the most joyous celebration of a person's relationship with God when they would bring the peace offering. It would be given by a person who wanted to shower praise upon the Lord. Some of the key aspects of it in chapter 3, and I'll just kind of hit the highlights so we understand the offering. In verse 2, you could bring a, a cow or cattle. In verse 6, something from the flock. Verse 12, a goat. One of the things that, they, that states they would lay their hands on it, thus identifying with the animal that they would be giving. Um, they would identify that this is, this is a, 
uh, in my place. It's, it's going fully to, to the Lord, just like I would be going fully to the Lord in, in my delight in Him. The fat would be taken from the animal when they, when they would take it, and they would take the, the, those, those fatty portions of the inner part of the animal, and that's what they would burn on the altar. They wouldn't take all the meat of the animal. Part of the meat of the animal would go to the priests, and they would take it, and they would have it for food for them. But here's the really cool thing about the peace offering. They would take the rest of the meat from the animal, and they would cook it. And as they're cooking it, the person who brought the animal would have the opportunity to stand up and declare his praises and his testimonies to the Lord and delight in God. And, and you can imagine uh, all the family would be gathered around as this person would be talking about all that God is and does and all that his relationship had accomplished in their life through the burnt offering and through the meal offering and now through this third, the peace offering. He's just delighting in God. And as that meat would cook, They'd take some of that meat and some of the meal offering, like the, we talked about last week, some of the bread and so forth, and then the family would feast. Right there at the tabernacle, right there uh, with God's presence, uh, they would just bask in Him. And the worshiper would invite other people to understand the blessings of the relationship that they were experiencing. And so others would get to join in at, and, and celebrate part of that the, that peace offering. It was just an awesome time of focusing on God, of expressing thanksgiving. Some examples of this in the Old Testament was, you remember Hannah, when she so longed and asked that God would give her a son. Well, after Samuel was born and he reached a certain age, she brought him back to the tabernacle. And she brought him back to the tabernacle with three young bulls and flour and a hint of flour and, and, and wine and this was a very lavish peace offering. She was saying, my relationship with the Lord has brought me a son. And this is a wonderful, I'm going to celebrate, I'm going to delight in what God has given me. He's given me a son. And as we know, Hannah gave her son as a vow, uh, fulfilling that vow, gave her son to the, the Lord's service at that time. So that would be an example of a peace offering. Another example of the peace offering is found in 1 Kings chapter 8 when Solomon dedicated the temple moving from the tabernacle to the temple and at that time that passage says there were 142,000 pieces of offering offered uh, over that two-week celebration as Solomon was leading the entire nation into the joy of all that God has given us and folks that nation the nation of Israel ate meat for two weeks uh, as a result of that. And we think that's you know, no big deal. We eat meat every day. Well, they didn't necessarily kill animals for their meat. They raised animals for what it produced. Um, and so eating the meat at a, a peace offering like this was a high celebration and a real joy and a real delight. We learned that all those who are in a relationship with God, all those who have been redeemed, all those from every era, yes, including us today, who have given the joy of being in a relationship with God, we should spontaneously participate in a communal act of worship as well. We ought to be bringing our peace offering as well. Maybe as I talked about that meal that was shared, maybe some of you thought about the meal that the Lord instituted, right? The Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is certainly a New Testament uh, way in which we can say, hey boy, aren't we delighting in God? Aren't we delighting all of His benefits? This is what God has done. And it's a public way for us to join together and in a sense delight in Him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 tells us that Jesus is our peace. In chapter 6 verse 15, it says that we're preaching the gospel of peace. Now, what we're able to say is, listen, when you come into a relationship uh, with God through the person Jesus Christ, there are some wonderful, wonderful benefits that you gain in a relationship with God. Colossians chapter 1 says, And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. Amen? I say whether, uh, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. You say, well, pastor, what are some of the things? I'm, I'm saved. I know that I'm saved. I'm in a relationship with him. And you're encouraging us that we should even in this era in our lives um, be people who 
offer these kind of offerings to the Lord, what should we be offering to the Lord? I'm glad you asked. Go forward. I'll just look at one passage. Uh, we could name many, but look at Romans, if you would. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. Now keep your place there in Leviticus. We're going to come back to it. But in Romans chapter 5, look at some of the things it mentions here. Verse 1, therefore being justified, right? That's our relationship. You're in the relationship with God. You're declared righteous. You're saved. What do we have? What are some of the benefits we have from God because we're in this relationship? It says in verse 1, by faith, we have peace with God. Friends, we're no longer in conflict with God. We, the, the battle has stopped. We're on God's side. Uh, we're not at enmity any longer. We have peace with God because of the work of Jesus Christ. Friend, that's one benefit we have. Verse 2, by whom we have access, right? We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We have the ability to, to really to stand in that relationship by God's grace. Uh, we have permission to be in that relationship because of God's grace. That's something we have. We didn't earn it. We couldn't get it. But God gave it as we earned that relationship. And what else do we have? That same verse. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we have something to look forward to, right? Uh, we have the glory of God and all that will be manifest one day. Jump to verse 5. As it goes through all the tribulation and what it works and what it produces, the end result of that, that hope makes not a shame because... The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Friends, um, this is another wonderful benefit that we have because He saved us, is that we have His love. And we're commanded to love one another. That's the command that Jesus gave us. But friends, we can't love one another as He loved us unless the Holy Spirit gives us and produces within us that kind of love one for another. If you're a part of the church and you've experienced love from another member in the church, that's just, that's just an example of God's rich blessing to you because of the covenant you have with Him through Christ. The love of God that's shed abroad in our hearts. What else do we have? Look at verse 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood. What else do we have? Curtis mentioned this. We are saved from wrath through Him. Now, because you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, when you, a sinner, stand before God, all that wrath has already been poured out. It's not going to fall upon you. You don't have to dread that standing before Him. And that's a wonderful benefit. We don't have to face the wrath of God. Verse number 11, And not only so, but we also just joy in God. We have joy in in God. Friends, these are just, just in that one passage alone, that's like five or six or seven different wonderful benefits we have because we're in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And you say, well, what is it that we have to delight in? What is it we have to give thanks about? What is it we have to sing about? What is it we have to remember in the Lord's table? What is it? Like, what, what is it? Friends, it's right there. All that we have, all that God has showered upon us, the, the, the freedom to live life and not fear death. Uh, the freedom to become more like Christ and to love others as He has loved us. We have that because of Christ. Now, now, now my question is, if we understand all the rich benefits we have being in Christ, how are we responding? How are we responding? Like, like if God is the one wearing the hat today and and you have the opportunity to say something about the relationship you have with God, what are you going to say? How are you going to praise Him? How are you going to exalt Him? How are you going to bring Him glory? Like, if you could bring Him a gift, what gift would you bring Him? So well, I understand, I, birthday boy, I'm going to you know, bring a gift that he's going to delight in. And if I'm going to bring a gift that my wife's going to delight in, my kids are going to delight in, it's probably going to cost me something. Sometimes, as Christians, we think, um, well, tithing is an obligation, right? Tithing is an obligation. It's just something that we're required to do. We're required, required to give a tenth. Let's just hit the pause button on tithing. Let's just let's talk about free will offering. Let's talk about a peace offering. I'm going to bring a bull. That's going to cost me something. No one's twisting my arm. No one's making me do that. I'm going to do that. Why? Because of all the wonderful blessings I have in God. 
It's just my natural response to bring an offering to him. Why, why shouldn't New Testament believers render offerings to God in the same way? Why shouldn't we lavish our love upon the Lord by offering, oh, well, I'm, I gave my tithe, so I'm good. No. What is, I just want to do something above and beyond. I want, to, I want to demonstrate my zeal for the Lord. I want, to, I want to give myself fully. I want to sing praises to Him. I want to lift up His name. Why? Because all that He's done for me. All that He's done for me. I want to give this offering to Him. And there's all kinds of ways we can do that. Public displays, testimonies, singing, giving, giving of our best, being reminded constantly that that the blessings we have are because he shed his blood. The giving of ourselves was implicit in this, in this offering. Let's move to the next two offerings then. Um, chapter 4 through chapter 6 give us two other offerings, and I want to touch on these offerings, uh, not just communing with God and delighting in him, but uh, these two offerings, the sin offering and the trespass offering, focus on cleansing. Cleansing. Not, not just communing with him, but, but cleansing. Cleansing meaning restoring our relationship with God because our sin had, has broken that relationship. And certainly, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, they would sin and, and they needed to be cleansed so they could come back to the temple and continue in their communing. So the first three author, uh, offerings establish fellowship with God. The last two offerings help people of God restore a broken fellowship with him. Uh, I've got an example for us to be reminded about that as well. Um, this is uh, members mark, you know, uh, they are disinfectant wipes. Amen? All right, with the season that we're in, it's helpful to, uh, to use these and use them often. Um, my daughter, in one of her science classes, had to take swabs of various things around our house. And, and my wife does a really good job cleaning our house, but she took a swab of the, uh, of the um, remote control on our television. And it was put in a culture dish, and we watched what grew. Needless to say, our remote control has been wiped with these things several times since that science experiment and other normal things around the house. I, was, uh, I heard that the average person gets two to four colds. The older you are, the less you get. The younger you are, the more you get. Children can get up to 12. Uh, it's like average, 10 to 12 colds in a given year. And it just happens. Living in the world we live in, there are germs. And so you, 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 know, you, you go to the store, and a lot of times there's disinfectant wipes just to wipe the handles on the, on the, on the carts, right? We go to the restroom, we encourage our kids to, to wash their hands, and then they touch the doorknob. Right? I mean, come on, there's just, there's just germs. And no matter how much you use a disinfectant wipe, no matter how careful you are, uh, the average is, uh, no matter how good your immunity is, you're going to get sick. Uh, you're going to get, you're going to catch germs. And that was the reality that Israel was facing. It didn't matter how careful they were in life, um, because they live in a sin-cursed, sin-fallen world, and because they have sin dwelling in them, they were, they were going to get in a place where they would become ceremonially unclean. They, they would need to be cleansed. They would, need, they would need to be wiped. They would need to be purged so they could come back into a relationship. So the sin offering and the trespass offering were designed by God to help people who had sinned or been tainted by sin in the community to come back in relationship with him because God really wants people to bring him glory. He wants people to commune with them. So the sin offering found in Leviticus chapter 4, the key word for that is restore. It's restore. The idea of the sin offering, it emphasized that we are guilty before God. Uh, the priest would examine and determine this is, this is what you need to, uh, to do to, to, to be clean. The sacrifice was needed. The sin offering focused on, on a violation of the law that was not necessarily even done with a deliberate intent. Um, it is based around the very... And chapter 4 is structured in this way. There are various types of people who would sin. So the priests would sin, and it talks about what the priests would need to do. It talks about the, el the nation would sin, and the elders would help resolve the sin of the, the nation. Uh, then the kings would sin, in verse 22, and it talks about what they would need to do and bring their sin offering. And then the common people. So let's look at verse 27, and we can identify with the commoners. 
that would sin. So we're back in Leviticus and chapter 4 now, reading about the sin offering. And, um, and we, we read this. And, it, and if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he hath sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin which he hath sinned. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. And the priest shall take the blood thereof and with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. He shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. And then verse 32 says that common man could also bring a lamb and the same process that he went through with the goat, he goes through with the lamb. And so it's interesting, and I encourage you to read the whole chapter, maybe this week or later this afternoon, as to see how the, the, what the priests needed to do, and they brought a bull, and the nation, the bull would be given for them, and the elders, uh, the, the rulers would have uh, an offering that they would bring in verse 22. And um, what it says about each one of these. In chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 13, it talks about some of the specific types of sins. And then in chapter 5, verse number 11, it takes us to, um, or chapter, verse 14, it takes us to the next offering, the trespass offering. And, um, and the trespass offering is unique from the sin offering, offering in this, that the trespass offering emphasized the damage that was done by the person. Really, like if a person lied or if a person stole, it cost somebody else in the community something. And so if they really wanted to demonstrate that they wanted to get right and get serious in their worship, then they would make it right with the other person in the community. It also has this component, that when we sin against God, it does damage to God. And so there, there's a sense in which his glory was defamed. And so we would bring an offering in addition to the sin offering to cover the sin, we would bring um, a trespass offering. And the trespass offering, watch this, is... 20% more than the damage. So if I sinned against you and cost you $10, I would, I would bring, you know, 20% more, right? So $12.50, I would bring that. Um, uh, or two, uh, $12, 20% more, I would bring, and I would give that to you as a demonstration. Man, I'm really sorry, and I want to repair. That's the key word. Write that in the blank. So the sin offering was to cleanse or restore. The trespass offering was to repair the relationship. To repair the relationship. Now, with the time that we have left, I want us to synthesize these two offerings because both offerings have the same goal. To bring this person who has sinned back into a relationship with God. And by the way, so you know where we're headed. We're in a relationship with God as Christians, but still we do, do we still sin? Okay, so we're going to look back at what do these people do to get back in a relationship with God and see if that at all informs us on how we as Christians, when we sin, how we can get back in a relationship with God, how we can get back uh, to proper worship and fellowship with God. So, again, there's a lot in this passage, but it, it's redundant. The same thing is being said over and over and over. There's these repeated concepts in chapter 4, 5, and 6 that really carry the punch of the text. So if on your handout you want to flip that over and jot down the next six statements, what you're going to find is these next six statements are found over and over and over and over in the passage and form the structure by which the Hebrew people could get back right with God and you'll find it's the very same structure that where we as Christians can get right with God after sin. Well, what is that? Well, first of all, we see that there's a sin through ignorance. So you can write that down. Number one, sin through ignorance. Or you can just write down the word trespass. Trespass. Right? A sin of ignorance was a sin that was done maybe inadvertently or by negligence. It wasn't premeditated. It wasn't necessarily intentional, uh, but it was something that they did and it broke their relationship with God. 
It's kind of like this. A, a sheep doesn't intend to get lost, but a sheep would just go its way. It would wander away, and it would get in peril. It would get out of the flock. It, it, it might become in danger. It, it might get in some thorns and thickets. And, 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 and it was obvious then when the shepherd found it or it wandered back in that it wasn't in a right condition. It, it didn't mean to go astray, but like a sheep, it just kind of strayed. It just kind of wandered. And that's the intent here, a sin uh, of, through ignorance, uh, sin through carelessness. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, talks about sins of carelessness. Like, uh, I, I witnessed something, and I didn't go and, and give testimony of that in court. That would be a sin. Uh, to touch an unclean animal or to be a par around an, a, a un, an unclean person would be a sin of carelessness. Or to swear a rash vow and not fulfill a vow would be a sin of carelessness. And then in chapter 5 and 6, the word trespass is used. And the word trespass is an offense against God's law or just a breach of trust against God. Like, I'm not trusting in God. I'm not going to follow His word. I'm not going to obey His command. That would be a trespass against God. It's an act of unfaithfulness to God, to be unfaithful to the covenant. We're in a covenant, but God, I'm just not wanting to do what you have called me to do. Chapter 5, verse 17 talks about disobeying God's command. Chapter 6, verse 2 through 5 talks about cheating others. These are all kinds of sins that would be dealt with, that would cause division. And so that's where it began. There were sins among the people. Well, the next thing we see throughout these two, two chapters, two and a half chapters, is this. He shall be guilty. You sin and you're guilty. That is not a popular thing today. We don't like the idea of being guilty. But in chapter 4, verse 13, 22, 27, chapter 5, verse 2, 3, 4, you see it. He is guilty. He is guilty. Look at chapter 5, right there in that 2, 3, 4. It ends. And he shall be unclean or guilty. The next verse, it ends. Verse 3. And he shall be guilty. And verse number 4. And he shall be guilty of these. Guilty, guilty, guilty. It's just repeated over and over. And in fact, that word guilt is only used in Leviticus in chapter 4, 5, and 6. So it is a major theme. When you sin or trespass, you're guilty. You've offended a holy God. You know, the, the way we deal with guilt today is the way some people try to handle their car when it breaks down. Like the engine light comes on, and the car is saying, something's not right, something's not working, and uh, we like... You know, I really don't have the money to, to fix this. I don't have money right now to take it in. I don't want to deal with that. So we, we open the door and we find the, the fuse box that handles all the, the lights on our dash. And we pull out the fuse and uh, close that fuse box up and we start the car back up and the light doesn't come on because we've disabled it by taking that fuse out, right? And so we think, hey, I'm good to go. I don't need to check my engine anymore. I fixed the problem, right? The problem is taken care of. And in today's world, in today's society, people are like, sin isn't the problem. Our conscience is the problem. Right? Anybody saying you're guilty is the problem. So we want to minimize the people around us who might actually identify anything and say, you know what, that's not right. God's not pleased with that. Uh, we, wanna, we, wanna, uh, we want people around us who will transform our conscience into saying, you know what, it felt good, so that, that justifies it, right? Um, it, it, I thought it was the right thing to do, so I'm okay. I'm not guilty. But friends, the Creator God says, no, that's a sin. And whether you want to squash your conscience or, or take the fuse out of your conscience or surround yourself with people who say you're okay, the reality is what's going on inside the hood is not good. We're all sinners. We're all guilty. And these offerings remind us there's sin, and where there's sin, there's guilt. But if you're in chapter 5, you'll notice uh, again, then in verse number five, here's the next word. Number three, the word is confess. Verse number five, it says, And it shall be, when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. It's just the opposite of taking the fuse bath. It's actually acknowledging. That's what the word confess here means. In the Psalms, the same word is used with the idea of to praise or give thanks unto God. 
That's primarily how this word is used. You're confessing wonderful things about God or you're acknowledging what is true about God. But when you're talking about your own behavior, we need to confess or acknowledge what is true about us as well. We need to confess the sin that is within. Well, the fourth key thing that just is over and over and over in these is the concept of blood. So, Number four is blood. Chapter 4, verse 7, 16, 17, 18, 25, it talks about you bring this animal, you lay your hands on the head of that animal, you cut the throat of that animal, and the priest catches the blood. Hebrews tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no putting away of sin. Blood had to be shed for sin to be dealt with. And we can't talk about a sin offering or restoring a relationship with somebody. We can't put away the sin that broke the relationship unless blood is shed. So that's a major theme that runs through this section. If we're going to talk about how to live in light of the, our relationship with the Lord, we have to keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. All right, number five is this. The priest shall make atonement. Man, I went through and I starred this. It's, it's like several times, like a, over a dozen times in these four chapters, we just see it over and over. He shall make an atonement for them. He shall make an atonement for them. He shall make an atonement for them. Make an atonement for them. Uh, chapter 4, verse 20, 26, 31, 35. Chapter 5, verse 6, 10, 13, 16. It's just over and over and over. Like at the end of every sacrifice, the priest would take the blood, and here's what making atonement meant. For some of them, for when it was a sin of the, 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 the elder, he would take it and he would actually go into, not the holy of holies, but the inner holy area, not where the, the, the altar was, but now where the, the brazen altar, the, 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 altar of in, the altar of incense was, that was continually burning before the Lord. And for the priest, uh, they would apply the blood there in that location. Because in a sense, the priest's sin had spread and, and caused a, a friction between the ability of the nation to worship in God. So it needed to be cleansed in that location. It, it, for the common person who would bring uh, a, an offering, a sin offering, a trespass offering, he would catch that blood and he would encircle the, the altar where the sacrifice, the, the fat of the sacrifice was going to be, and he would just pour the blood on the horns of that altar and then shower it all around the altar. He would atone, or he would, he would, he would apply it and that was making the atonement, or making, in a sense, because the death of the animal, we are now at one. We are no longer at odds. We're back in this relationship. And the putting away of sin could only be when the blood was applied. So the priest would make atonement. And you know what? Every time followed this reality, when the priest made atonement, here's the last statement. Here's the last statement you can write down. When the priest made the atonement it shall be forgiven him forgiveness followed the application of the blood forgiveness followed the application of the blood now this statement involves more than just pardon it extends in this concept it is a renewing of the covenant it is a renewing of the covenant. It means this, that a broken relationship has been repaired. The sinner has been forgiven. The sanctuary has been purified. The access to God has been restored. Proverbs 28, verse 13, the wise man reminds us, the one that covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes shall have mercy. And that is true in Leviticus, and that is true in the wisdom literature, and friends, that is true in our own lives as well. I want you to turn to one last passage before we close. That's 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. How do we, that's, that's our question we started in the message, was, how do we live in a relationship with God? We're in a relationship with God. How do we live in that relationship? Well, we should delight in Him. We should celebrate Him. We should offer offerings to Him. We should give ourselves to Him. We should, we should do all that. But yes, in a relationship with God, we also sin. What do we do in our relationship with God when we sin? Well, we've, we've just learned this pattern from Leviticus. We find this pattern repeated in 1 John chapter 1. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Amen? I mean, we're justified. We're in this relationship with God. Isn't it wonderful? Great. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. I mean, if we say, hey, wait a second, I'm not guilty. I've not sinned. I'm done sinning. I don't sin. I didn't sin anymore. You say, you're, you're telling a lie. That's not, that's not true. If we do what? Confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My children, these things write I unto you that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the propitiation for our sin and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Friends, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through chapter 2 reminds us that there was a blood sacrifice that was made. It was made by Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for our sin. He is, that word means, the atoning sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. And that blood was poured out and covered your sin. And you can continue to have a relationship with God because the work of Jesus Christ covered not just the sins you had in your life the day you got saved, but the work of Jesus Christ covers all your sin. What's our responsibility? Well, what was the responsibility of the person? They were to, they were to bring this offering. They were to lay hands on this offering. They were to acknowledge by laying hands on the offering, this was my sin. And my sin cost something's life. And, 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 and blood has to be shed. And they're confessing, this is what I did wrong. And if I did something that cost somebody, I'm willing to make it right. I'm willing to repair the relationship, right? And that's what they're saying. They're confessing their need. And the high priest would take the blood and apply it. Friends, guess what? As a Christian, we do the same thing. We acknowledge our sin. We identify who will give his life to cover our sin. As a Christian here, if you've engaged in sin this week and the Holy Spirit is convicting you right now of that sin, you probably just can't wait for an opportunity to come and tell the Lord, thank you for shedding your blood that I can worship today. Thank you for shedding your blood that I could be in a relationship with you and continue to have all the blessings of the relationship because you did that for me. And to confess that, oh, I sinned, God. But I know that that blood is already applied. I know that I am, present tense, forgiven. I know that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I recognize and I delight in that. How do I live in a relationship with God? Friends, I remember Christ's sacrifice and confess my sin with an intent to turn and walk in a relationship with Him. That's what we learn from Leviticus chapter 4 through 6. God gets this. He's wearing this. As we close our time in prayer, I wonder, when's the last time you acknowledged that we can delight in all of his benefits toward us to offer praise to him? We get this. Because I'm the dirty one. God cleanses me because he's so holy. And when God cleanses me by the blood of Jesus Christ, I can come back and commune with him. Maybe today you need to delight in him. And maybe today you need to be cleansed by him. Let's pray together.